Mayor Lynch into, I mean, isn't there some point where you've got to say, hey, I've got a conflict of interest here? You don't feel any kind of scintilla of ethics on this thing at all? Uh, totally. I, I, I operated very consistently with the, in the ethic guidelines I had as Secretary of the Treasury. And when it became, uh, when, when it became clear that, that uh, we had some very significant issues with uh, Goldman Sachs and with, 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 Why didn't you recruit with, yourself with Morgan then? Stanley. What I did then, it would have been very wrong for me to recuse myself. What I did was I went and got a waiver from the ethics agreement because when we had concerns... Who was in charge of the ethics agreement? What? Who's in charge of the ethics agreement we, that you got a waiver? We, we have, we have an uh, office of, of ethics of Treasury and we have a White House ethics office. So you got it from the legal counsel from the White House? We, we, we got it from the, uh, the, the yeah. government ethics office. So we had Snow, we had Paulson, now we have Geithner. All these people cut from the same bowl of cloth. Uh, these are not independent Treasury secretaries. They're uh, part of the problem, not part of any solution. And it would have been nice to see uh, President Obama effect some change in Treasury, but he, of course, he went and got a, a Wall Street insider uh, as his Treasury secretary. Everything that's speculative, parasitical, cancerous, bloated from all these administrations, going back to Carter and even beyond, comes together in the Obama administration. With Volcker, with Summers, who's part of the uh, economic crimes under Clinton, the guy who brought you derivatives and the abolition of the Glass-Steagall firewall. You could not have gotten a more perfect setup for a takeover from a previous government the Bush regime uh, than the Obama regime. Now there are some authors out there already saying that it's the same bunch. It's true. It's the same bankers who put the same boys forward. Obama, far from helping the public and giving them something new or giving them more power and say over their own affairs, has actually sided immediately with the bankers who once again, once again, have robbed the public blind and now they must get bailed out by your tax money. Obama does it all with left cover. He makes you think that he's somehow different from Bush, that this is somehow benevolent, that he cares about the poor. And in reality, this is the cruelest hoax and the most bogus sham. Obama is 1,000% devoted to Wall Street interests. When Wall Street says jump, Obama jumps. And again, it's about 30 to $40 for the bankers for every dollar that ever reaches an unemployed person or somebody who's on food stamps or some infrastructure building for highways. The hope with the Obama administration was that it would move us beyond this. But unfortunately, what we're seeing more and more is that Obama has brought in uh, many of the economists who bought into the system in the past. Uh, Larry Summers is a, is a very good example. And, uh, and, and so many of his economists, many of the people there, you can really almost at this point relate Obama to Hoover, who did something similar in his presidency, as opposed to uh, Franklin Roosevelt, for example, who brought in a very fresh team. So the concern here now is that Obama's falling into this trap of bringing in the same people who put us in the position that we're in today and other people who buy into the same theories that brought us here, this mutant form of capitalism. Presumably what most politicians want to come in is say, hey, the problems of the past, they're due to the old guy and I'm cleaning house and I'm going to bring in a new team and don't blame us for the things we've inherited. Can't say, you know, those policies of the past that came before were insane because you got the guy that was one of the key architects of those policies. People need to stop having allegiance to their political party. They need to have allegiance to the Bill of Rights, the Constitution, and what has made our republic so special. The basic human rights and dignity that every citizen of this country inherently has. Not because it's some right given to us by government, but because our Bill of Rights, our Constitution, enshrines that these are inalienable rights 
given to us by God that we inherently have as sentient, free, conscious beings. But instead, the public cheers on the Republicans as they win or cheers on the Democrats as they defeat the Republicans. It's an endless, staged, gladiatorial event, special interest own both parties, and they project this false left-right paradigm up as like a movie screen. And behind that, behind the throne, the establishment is able to control our society and engineer it into this high-tech police state. If you try to uh, let the finance oligarchs who created the crisis turn around and say they're the doctors who are going to get you out of the crisis, they will dig you deeper and deeper into the bottomless abyss of world economic depression, financial collapse, and disintegration. The Democrats have really done more to destabilize the American economy and to help the big banks on Wall Street than the Republicans have done. I would imagine that the Republicans know a little bit more about finance and markets enough that when someone like Goldman Sachs asks the Congress to change laws as they did in the 90s to do away with position limits on the futures contracts, the Republicans would have said, no way, that's completely inconsistent with any notion of a fair market. But the Democrats, I have a feeling, are just not financially literate enough to say no. And I think that Goldman has very shrewdly positioned themselves with the Democrats because the Democrats typically, like many NGOs that I've run into, they seem to have a, a complete inability to comprehend these issues of markets and finance and how it relates to social justice. So under the Democrats, we also saw the repeal of Glass-Steagall. Glass-Steagall said there's an inherent conflict of interest between the commercial banking side, which is the lending side, and the investment banking side, which is taking an ownership position. And we have to end this conflict of interest by separating these two entities. You can have investment banks and you can have commercial banks, but they have to be separate. Do you think that the repeal of Glass-Steagall was a tragic mistake? Uh, no, I don't think so. You could be a commercial bank, like Chase Manhattan, or you could be an investment house, like J.P. Morgan, or a bank like Bank of America, or an investment house like Merrill Lynch. But you couldn't be both. And as the 90s went on, the, the screaming uh, hyenas of Wall Street were demanding that this prohibition, this regulation, be abolished. This was an illegal and inappropriate form of casino. The derivatives were being used, and they were being unregulated, and the people were getting 30 to 1, 40 to 1, 50 to 1, and sometimes 100 to 1 profits on the way up. And remember, derivatives are a zero-sum game. So there's nothing there. It's not like a piece of stock in, in General Electric or Ford or something like that where there's supposed to be some value. Derivatives have no value. But the very people, Summers and, and, and Gettner and all the people at, at Goldman Sachs and J.P. Morgan who created these things, made not millions or billions but trillions on the way up and now that these things are crashing the very same folks the very same folks are now put in charge of regulating these things and in charge of the bailout and they are giving money to the very rascals that created this problem took the profits the problem cannot be fixed and this is on Obama's watch right now. You have so many different uh, schemes and mechanisms at play. It's sort of like after there's a blackout, you know, people in some parts of the country have been known to loot the uh, local stores. You know, they go in, they grab the televisions, and they grab the stereos. And basically that's what the Wall Street gang has done. They've, they've just uh, engaged in this massive looting of, uh, of, of money from uh, their own companies and, and now from the U.S. Treasury. There was a lady called Brooksley Bourne. She was the head of the Commodity Futures Trading Commission under Clinton. And she said, look, we have these derivatives. Why don't we at least make them reportable so we know how many there are and where, where they are? And she writes uh, in a, a biographical account. She said, I picked up the phone, and Larry Summers was screaming at me that I was interfering with the wonderful inventiveness and ingenuity of Wall Street and their ability to come up with new financial products, such as these derivatives. Brooksley Bourne was uh, the chair 
of the Commodities Future Trading Commission, CFTC, um, which regulates many financial derivatives. And she said there's a grave danger out there in the form of these credit default swaps. Uh, and credit default swaps are a exotic financial derivative or moderately exotic financial derivative um, that were sold on a bright shining lie that they were supposed to make markets more efficient. Uh, in fact, they allow utterly insane gambles and they're really great devices for accounting fraud as well. She actually says, I'm thinking of adopting this regulation. The Clinton administration goes berserk, and in particular, Larry Summers, uh, but also Rubin. Now behind Larry Summers, there's another layer. Bob Rubin of Goldman Sachs, the Clinton administration, and Citibank, and he also thought that derivatives were a wonderful thing for the U.S. economy, and he made sure that they were never regulated. Also, we can't forget Alan Greenspan over at the Federal Reserve. Now, you look at Summers, he is sitting in the White House today, making policy for Obama. Summers tells Obama what to do. Summers tells Geithner what to do. He's also got some of his hatchet people in the administration. Mary Shapiro runs the Securities and Exchange Commission. She refuses to ban uh, naked short selling and other market manipulations. You've also got another guy called Gensler over at the Commodity Futures Trading Commission today. He is an acolyte and a supporter of the derivatives bubble. We made the new CFTC chair a guy who had helped to kill Brooksley Bourne's reform initiatives. And, and we just did this under the Obama administration. This was a pre registered, pre-organized, predetermined event. Anybody who knows that if you allow the banks to become unregulated financial institutes with tsunami-like, weapons of mass destruction-like financial instruments like derivatives, to allow that to run up to levels that are 50, 100, 200 times the gross domestic product with no value. They know that they are taking the profits on going up, but they also know that the end result is the destruction and gutting of this economy. The scam is simple. The insiders buy hard assets and political influence as the fiat bubbles expand. And then, at a time of their choosing, they purposefully implode the bubble. You've got a very small group of people and the Federal Reserve and the global central banking system and the Bank of International Settlements in Switzerland who are purposefully managing the boom and bust, credit supply, credit contraction, money supply growth, money supply contraction to create artificial roller coasters and artificial volatility that they can trade around without taking any risk. It doesn't cost them any money. And if they do make a mistake because they're, as George Bush said, oh, the bankers on Wall Street are drunk. It is uncertain. There's no question about it. Let's say they walk in one day and they push the wrong button and they lose the bank a billion or five billion or a hundred billion, they can appeal to the government to bail them out. It's a totally asymmetric relationship between bankers and the rest of the economy. If they make a mistake, they get bailed out. If everyone else makes a mistake, they get put in jail, called a terrorist, and we never hear from them again. But it's a more sophisticated form of slavery. And we're going through it today. We see the taxation is going up all the time with the with the supposed crash of the banks that was not uh, a happening out of the blue. It was set up for this time. They could have kept it going for another few years if it suited them, and then crashed all the bubbles. But now is the time, as they say in their own writings, now is the time. One of the great benefits of an economic model from an economist standpoint is you can basically get whatever results you want. Uh, you can manipulate the inputs to make that happen. And that makes it uh, a very easy tool to use to 